Hi, this is Dan, and I'm making a quick video on James Arminius. If you Google Arminius, you'll find all kinds of things. A breed of dog, a German chieftain who defeated the Romans, and a type of revolver. But I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about James Arminius, who was a Christian, and he was a Dutch theologian just after the Protestant Reformation. He lived from 1560 to 1609, and he was a pastor at the Church of Amsterdam for 15 years. He was one of their first pastors just after that city converted from Catholicism to uh, the Protestant faith. He was also one of the first systematic theology professors at the University of Leiden, and he's most famous for opposing Calvinism, and the system he developed is known as Arminianism today. To give a little bit about his background, he was his family was killed in a massacre by the Spanish in, in his hometown of Odewater. So at a young age, he was an orphan, but people took him in out of charity, and they supported him, and they sent him off to school. And he became a brilliant student. He was well-trained in theology and also classic languages, Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and uh, also philosophy. And he traveled around in, in various schools, but he also studied in Geneva under Theodore Beza. The significance of Beza is important, so I'll use a Star Wars analogy because I love Star Wars to explain uh, what Beza means here. Uh, Qui-Gon Jinn trained Obi-Wan Kenobi, who trained Anakin Skywalker, who turned on Obi-Wan, his mentor. John Calvin founded the school in Geneva, and he trained his son-in-law, Theodore Beza, who was running the school at Geneva. And he's a trained Arminius who turned on Beza. Now, the reason why both Anakin and, and Arminius turned is the same. They both turned because of love. Anakin fell in love, which was outside of the Je Jedi Code. Arminius saw the love of God as so powerful, so moving, when he looked at Beza's explanation of predestination, he said, I cannot accept that explanation of predestination because God's love is so powerful. So they turned for the, on their mentors for the same reason, for love. Anakin and Arminius also have something else in common. They're just way cooler than their mentors. So how did the controversy start? When Arminius was in Amsterdam, he was preaching through the book of Romans, chapter by chapter. When he got to the second half of Romans 7, his, some Calvinists took exception to what he was saying about the passage. The second half of Romans 7 describes a person stuck in sin. Arminius said the passage is talking about prevenient grace, God's work in a person's life just before salvation. The Calvinists said, no, it's talking about a person after they get saved. The passage talks about a person that's trapped in sin. He's stuck, he can't do what he wants to do, he's serving sin. And Arminius said, God uses the law to teach people that they need a Savior, that they're trapped, they're stuck in sin, and that they're under God's judgment, and that they can't save themselves, and they need someone's help. And that's God's work just before salvation. But the Calvinist said, no, it's talking about God's work after salvation. And that was the first controversy when, he, when Arminius was in Amsterdam. Well, Arminius moved to Leiden. He was a systematic theology professor, and he had a fellow professor by the name of Gomorrah. When Arminius was teaching the students on predestination, Gomorrah objected to his views. Arminius said, predestination is God choosing to save believers. Gomorrah said, well, that's true, but his choice includes everything, including the means of salvation, even our faith, even Adam's fall, so that we would need to be saved in the first place. But Arminius objected. He said, no, that makes God the author of sin, and it removes man's choice. And that was the key issue for Arminius, that if God was predestining the fall, then he was the author of sin, and that would be out of character for God. The controversy grew and grew, and eventually it became a national affair. And it's very odd to think of a theological debate to become a national affair, but it was. People would debate this in their houses. It was debated in the political arena. It was debated everywhere throughout the country. Arminius was accused of heresy. He, one of his most famous writings today is his response to 31 articles. He was accused of 31 heresies, and he wrote a detailed response to each one. Those responses can be found in the works of James Arminius today. But because he was being accused of heresy, Arminius knew he needed a solution to the whole thing. So he was asking for a national synod. What he wanted was all the churches to get together and talk about the issue and come up with some resolution. And he received partial vindication during his lifetime. The government asked for him to put his uh, the 
thoughts into writing. So he wrote up his Declaration of Sentiments. That's also available in the works of James Arminius, and it's probably his most famous writing. There he explained exactly what his views on predestination and grace and free will were, and he summarized everything in, into that document. The document was reviewed, and eventually they decided not only that this isn't heresy, but they actually asked the Calvinists to be accepting of his views, or at least not to charge him with heresy. So for, for a while, Arminius had partial vindication. In the aftermath, after Arminius had passed away, his followers summarized his view to five points, known as the five points of the Remonstrants. But the Calvinists grew in political support. Their leader, their political leader, Maurice, um, started to look more and more like he was going to take over all of the Netherlands. And because of that, the Calvinists had more and more support, and they be became more and more bold. They called together the Synod of Dort, and the Synod lasted six months, and it had about 400 pastors and teachers. So it was very expensive, but Maurice was willing to pay for it. And the Synod treated the Arminians as uh, people on trial. There was only 13 out of the 400 people that were remonstrants uh, that were allowed to be at the Synod. And they weren't allowed to speak freely, and eventually they were kicked out of the Synod. So the Synod continued without them, and the conclusion of the Synod was that Arminianism was rejected. And the Arminian pastors in the Netherlands were uh, thrown out of their pulpits. There was about 200 of them that were kicked out. And the, most of them had to leave the Netherlands. But they formed a church, and Arminianism eventually began to spread. And it became very successful in England, through Anglicans, Baptists, and later through Methodists. The most famous Arminian was probably John Wesley. John Wesley had a real passion and heart for God and for missions. And he was a very fervent preacher. And through his preaching... Uh, the gospel spread, and Arminianism spread as well. And that's probably why today uh, most churches in England and in America are more Arminian than Calvinist. So let's take a quick look at the five points of the Remonstrants. They're conditional election, unlimited atonement, total depravity, resistible grace, and security. Conditional election is the belief that God chooses to save believers. It's in contrast to unconditional election, where God doesn't choose people based on either faith or works or anything about them, but he chooses people wholly for his own sovereign reasons which he hasn't revealed to us. The next point is unlimited atonement. Unlimited atonement is the belief that Christ died for everybody and that God wants everyone to be saved and everyone's salvation is possible, but only believers will be cleansed through Christ's blood. This is in contrast to limited atonement, the belief that Christ did not die for everybody, but he died for the elect alone. Limited atonement is also known as definitive atonement, the belief that Christ's death guarantees the salvation of those that he died for. The next point is total depravity. On this, Calvinists and Arminians agree. Both sides agree that man absolutely needs and requires God's grace for every step. Man cannot turn to God because he is so sinful. He needs God to come to him first. The next point is resistible grace. Resistible grace is the, is the idea that when God's grace comes to a person and starts drawing them to him, they can choose to say no. They can choose to resist God's grace. They can choose not to believe. It's in contrast to irresistible grace, the idea that once God's grace starts drawing somebody, they can't choose to say no, they can't resist, and they can't choose not to believe. The last point is security, and on this, the Romans Trump said that they needed to research the matter in Scripture, that it was complicated, and they wanted to look into it. That's why today there are Arminians that say uh, people do fall away from their faith, lose their connection with Christ, and ultimately perish. And there's some that say, no, that'll never happen. True believers will never fall away. So Arminians today fall in both camps. Calvinists, on the other hand, took a very firm stance that true believers will never fall away. Okay, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed it. God be with you.